Okay, we're back. We're live. Welcome to 10 o'clock here on a given Thursday. We're talking tax with Tom. That's Tom Yamachika. He's the president of the Hawaii Tax Foundation. Thank you for joining us, Tom. Always glad to be on the show, Jay. You concern yourself with fiscal policy, as you should, because it's so directly connected and, 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 and intrinsically involved with taxation. Um, but we have a, an interesting you know, problem these days because revenues have been down. They're likely to go further down before they come up. I mean, tax revenues, that is receipts by the state. At the same time, the state is called upon to do lots of special things. Um, and, and one third thing is that we have a lot of state employees who mm, are home but not working and who are nevertheless paid. We don't know exactly how many. So the state has all these things tugging at it, financial, fiscal things. The legislature was out of session for mm, a long time. It came back for mm, about a week, then it went into recess yet again. And it's going to be in recess until, I don't know, the middle of June. Um, I'm just describing the universe of our discussion here. And the Council of Revenues is supposed to be meeting, what, next week, I think. Uh, and they're going to try to tell us what we have coming in. Oh, I can tell you. Uh, you don't need the council. I can just tell you right now what's coming in. Nothing's coming in. Um, so, Tom, where are we? Uh, where is the ledge? What are the burdens of the ledge? What can the ledge? Give us options, will you? Save us. <laughs> Well, uh, let me let me tell you uh, first what uh, you know what, what the ledge has done, and, and um, uh, it's it's a very interesting uh, situation. And there was an an article uh, that Senator Laura Thielen uh, wrote in Civil Beat this morning. Uh, a, a lot of the action in the legislature in the last few days has been in deciding how to deploy uh, the you know many millions of dollars that have been given to the state uh, by the federal government for COVID-19 relief. Um, and uh, yeah, in, in, the, in the CARES Act, uh, there was, uh, I forget how much um, uh, additional was uh, sent to the state, uh, uh, $1.25 billion. Uh, pretty much directly. And so what did they do with it? Um, well, uh, we earmarked $1 billion for uh, budget shortfalls mm -hmm. in 2020 and 21 to avoid furloughs and cuts. Uh, we gave neighbor islands, eh, you know, some money because uh, the, the city and county of Honolulu got got some federal money directly. So, uh, but the but the less populous counties, um, uh, you know, weren't large enough to be uh, on the federal radar, uh, you know, which is something happening across the country. So some some of that uh, uh, you know billion dollars went to them, and then um, about six hundred and fifty million dollars. Uh, went into the rainy day relief fund. And um, that is kind of troubling to me because uh, it, it seems, you know, according to the, the um, Senator Thielen's article, uh, it was there so the governor couldn't touch it. Now, one of the, one of the, the requirements, okay, of uh, this federal money is that you got to spend it by the end of the year. If you don't spend it by the end of the year, it goes back. You mean fiscal right. or calendar? Calendar. Mm -hmm. By, by 12 31 2020. Mm -hmm. If you don't spend it by 12 31 2020, um, the feds won't give it to you. Now, this is a phenomenon that's not unprecedented at all. Uh, we've had problems with spending federal money before. Uh, Department of Transportation had this had this issue. Department of Hawaiian Homelands had this issue. Board of Water Supply uh, had this issue. Um, and where well, we lost it? No, no because we didn't we didn't spend it and we lost it. I remember some stories like that. 
Yeah, uh, there was some tension, um, or at least we got some nasty letters from the Fed saying, you know, you don't you don't lose this money. I mean, you don't use this money. Uh, you know, we're not going to give it to you anymore. I mean, and that's. I mean, it, it sounds. What kind about of the rainy thing. day? What about the rainy day fund? Uh, uh, is that using it? No. You see, using it doesn't mean squirreling it away. So you have to actually spend the money by the end of the year. Okay. Um, now, uh, there are a couple of problems with that. Um, one is kind of a self um, self made problem. And and that is okay. So 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 the rainy day fund now contains like maybe three or four hundred million dollars. You're adding another six hundred fifty. Okay, there there's a stipulation in the rainy day fund statute that says you can't spend more than half of it uh, in one year. Uh oh. But I, I think the legislature feels uh, that it it isn't a problem for them because when when they appropriate the money uh they can you know put another sentence in the appropriation act saying um oh this this provision doesn't apply but there's one other thing that that i think they haven't thought about and that is we have a governor who has declared a state of emergency and is not shy about suspending the laws and there is a provision in the emergency power statutes that says if you want, it, it, uh, laws can be suspended by the governor uh, to relieve suffering. And um, I, I think it's not a very uh, large stretch of the imagination to say, oh, um, we've got needs of the people like uh, shoring up the employment uh, the unemployment insurance fund uh, and having it squirreled away in the rainy day fund where I can't touch it is a hardship. And in order to relieve the suffering of the people, I, I, will, uh, I will suspend that law and spend the money. So are you, and, telling, and, are, are you saying that there's a contention going on between the legislature and the governor? Wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and, and it's not like the governor hasn't done that already because uh, as I wrote a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, the governor al already has suspended the, 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 the distribution provision in the transit accommodations tax uh, to basically stop TAT money from going to the counties. Aside from all the other suspensions that have nothing to do with fiscal policy. Right. Like information practices, that sort of thing. It has nothing to do with the emergency, he declared. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, the, 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 the suspension of the, of, of, the, of the money going to the counties, uh, I think that's really sketchy. Um, the possibility of suspending the restrictions on the emergency and budget stabilization fund, I think that's also sketchy, but it's I think it's less sketchy. Uh, we we have we have a definite need for uh, you know use of the unemployment monies, uh, for example, um, because and and this is another symptom we 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 can't get the money out the door fast enough. You know, we have these administrative backlogs. Um, we we have, um, uh, you know, so much money in unemployment claims wherein the participants haven't got, I mean, the, uh, the claimants haven't gotten a dime. They've lost their jobs. Uh, they're entitled to unemployment um, help from the state. And, and no money, no money's moving. So, wasn't there a move to try to get some of these state employees who were at home collecting their paychecks, not doing anything, and move them around to help on processing these claims? Make you know, continue to pay them for their other job, but have them deployed 
to help on uh, unemployment insurance payments? Unemployment uh, compensation. Yes, there's a program to do that. It's voluntary on the employee's part. They have to um, you know, volunteer to do this. And you know, staff of several departments, including a legislative staff, um, uh, could and did sign up to do that. And they went down to the convention center where they've got a few, you know, a few hundred workstations uh, ready and, and deployed um, so they can help with that process. But number one, it's voluntary. So the people who want to stay at home and, and watch TV and still get their full pay are, are staying at home and watching TV and getting their full pay. Mm. Uh, and um, some of the unions uh, basically say, no, you're not, you're not moving my people around. UPW, for example, explicitly said that. Uh, so I think there's some pressure uh, for UPW members not to not to even do that. Well, you know, let me let me say that uh, in this show about New Zealand just last hour, uh, we had uh, Karina Lyons and um, uh, uh, Tim Woods out of uh, East West Center, and they talked about New Zealand. They talked about how, and this was reported in a number of um, international journals, that everybody in the cabinet was on the same page. They were listening to the scientists and they were listening to the people, both, and making reasoned decisions, reasoned, balanced decisions on how to cope with it. It was admirable. I say that not because it, somebody opined in one newspaper, uh, but because the, the opinions were the same in multiple newspapers. And, and uh, I would have to say that although you know, people give Hawaii credit for having low COVID numbers, uh, I don't think we get Hawaii credit for being on the same page. I don't think we get credit for coordinating our efforts and being efficient and finding, you know, uh, uh, efficient policies, efficacious policies. Um, that's, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, certainly um, the, uh, the snafu around opening, opening the shopping malls uh, illustrates that. So, so the governor issues uh, or goes on, the, on, 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 TV saying, oh yeah, we'll, we'll uh, reopen the shopping malls. Uh, Caldwell says no, uh, and, uh, and the governor backpedals. Uh, so, so we had to wait a few more days before we, before we can get our shopping malls open. You know, the problem with it is, uh, we'll get back to the fiscal in a minute. The problem with it is if you open the shopping malls, the restaurants and everything, uh, or a lot of things, then you take a risk that uh, the infections will increase again. And um, you can't be complacent about it. You have to be on guard. Um, and the question- well, I think that's what you got to do uh, nonetheless. Nonetheless, right. Uh, otherwise, what happens is you have a resurgence and you're unprepared for it. So you have to keep on pushing on the public health side. And, and I'm not sure that we're doing that. I, I think we're making the same mistake that Trump is making, where we're focusing on reopening the economy, but we kind of have taken our hand off the stick on developing testing and tracking and social distancing as necessary. Um, and, and that's an example of a sort of confused government policy here. But anyway, uh, let's go back to the fiscal management side. So <clears throat> Council on Revenues is, is gonna come in, we don't, we, we don't have too much issue. It, it's gonna say we don't have revenues. Uh, and this uh, billion plus that we got from the CARES Act, uh, that's not going to carry it. Our our annual budget in the state is was it 11, 12 billion, something like that. Um, yeah, fourteen. We're going to be fourteen. We're, we're going to be way underwater. What happens? Well, we do we do have stuff coming in. Uh, it's just it's just not as much as you know. There there were some revenue numbers from April that came out yesterday. Um, there there is money coming in. Uh, of course, not as much as you know, people would like, but it's, it's not like it's going to shut off completely. Uh, some people are still working. They are, they are uh, getting income tax withheld. That's going in. GE tax is still getting paid. That's coming in. Um, corporate, corporate tax is way down. Um, TAT is down a little bit. I thought it would be down more. Um, but that's kind of what's been happening. 
you know, you want, you know, one thing is if you, if you say, okay, everybody, you can, you know, we can return to normal. Um, that, that doesn't um, excite me as a potential consumer in the new normal. I'm, I'm still going to be concerned. I'm not going to go into a crowd. I'm not going to go to a shopping center. I'm not going to eat at a restaurant. Not now. I'm, I'm going to have to wait and see, you know, whether this is going to work. No, I think there's a lot of that's people. Right. That's yes, right. it always is. That's and and a lot of a lot of people are going to be feeling the same way. They're not going to just rush back in and and start consuming and spending money and taking risks. They're not going to do that. So if you if you say that the revenues of these various establishments, um, the tax from those revenues is 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 going to be meaningful increase, or at least an increase the way it was. Um, I don't think that's true. I think it's going to take a long time before you have the same revenues and tax going into the state coffers. So we're yeah. going to suffer yeah, well, a lot one, more one in terms of tax I've revenues. Seen, one thing that I've been seeing is that the the legislature um, ha has been kind of very strongly emphasizing uh, no cuts to the public sector. Whereas, you know, people well, in, mean no in cuts the to all sector. those state employees. That's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, no cuts at all. Um, no position, you know, uh, no position reductions, no salary reductions. Uh, yes, they'll, they'll, they'll defer their, uh, their pay increases uh, until a later time. Uh, but that doesn't mean uh, that the pay increases won't come. It'll, it'll just happen later. Um, and and here in the public in the private sector, um, we, we got disaster. We have a disaster. We have uh, layoffs in an, in an unprecedented scale. Mm -hmm. We have we have businesses that are closing, like Neiman Marcus uh, declaring bankruptcy. Uh, was it J Crew declaring bankruptcy? Uh, we we have a number of establishments that have you know shut down temporarily for for covid-19 but they're not going to reopen i mean we don't know it we don't know now what the extent of it's going to be but not everybody's going to reopen well, some people a lot of people are going to uh, a lot of people are going to file bankruptcy a lot of these small businesses are going to go away they can't pay the rent uh, they're going to lose their leases they're going to be subject to foreclosure they're going to have no relief coming in. And I don't think CARES has given them enough to really make the difference, a lot of them. So what, you know, so let me give you a, a scenario here. So the public sector, okay, no, no increases, not for now, um, but everything else is frozen. A lot of them are not working. They're at home. Uh, we don't know how many, um, but the cost of running the public sector, and I guess that's, you're referring to both state and county. It is a flat, it's a flat, it's, it's essentially 100%, and the legislature is supporting this, 100% of what it was. In the case of the private sector, it's decimated, and let's say, I'm being charitable, it's somewhere between 40 and 50% of what it was, could be, could be less. Um, there's something grossly uh, inequitable about that. And aside from the you know, the sense of fairness, the sense of inequity about it. Um, it's more than that. It's going to twist our economy. It's going to twist the way the state works. It's going to make the, the state uh, system, the state employees, which many people feel is bloated anyway, has been bloated for decades. Uh, hiring, 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 um, and um, so forth. Uh, and it's going to make the private sector, which has been under pressure from the state sector, right? This is not a friendly place to do business. Why is it unfriendly? Because the state has state employees have all these you know, controls, um, permitting, for example, and processing, which they don't do very quickly. So the private sector, which has been under pressure for a long time, um, now is under much, much, much greater pressure. What do you get when that happens? Because after all, the private sector has to pay the cost in ordinary times. It has to pay the cost of running 
the state and the counties. So if the private sector isn't making any money for a long time, maybe forever, how do we pay the cost of government? Well, yeah, you can't. Um, well, what I've been you know, talking about and writing about for, for a very, very long time is, you know, uh, those in state government, those, those of us who are lawmakers and leaders need to understand that uh, we have an economic engine and you got to take care of your engine or it's not going to spin around and, and, and produce the money that you need uh, to run your government. Because if you think about it, uh, a lot of the taxes that are imposed are, are imposed on business uh, and are premised on, okay, if business earns money, then, then you've got to share some of it with the government. Okay, well, what if you got no business? Or what if what if the uh, the uh, uh, the businesses aren't aren't making money? They they can maybe pay their costs, but but that's it. And that's kind of the situation we have now. Um, well, some of them can't pay their yeah. costs. Some of them can't pay their costs. They go out of business, and then they got nothing. And, and in the meantime, uh, we have, and and I, I don't you know. I don't say this is going to be a permanent fix, but we have money lying around. Okay, the legislative auditor has has gone uh, and queried our state financial system, and he's come up with you know a couple of reports uh, saying, "Oh, have you considered this special fund or that special fund or uh, you know all, all this kind of stuff?" Um, where there are millions of dollars. And let me give you an example. Um, there is the uh, uh, High Five Fund, sometimes known as the Dep Deposit Beverage Container uh, Program Fund. Okay. Um, previous auditors reports complained of irregularities, but even after all of that, the program special fund has been steadily swelling over the years to the tune of around $5 million each year. We got $49 million in the fund. We're not spending nearly that much. So, so why don't we do something with that 49 million? Uh, we have, um, let's, let's, let's take a nice juicy one here. Um, EBIT has a dwelling unit revolving fund uh, with $154.9 million balance and average cash out per year of $17.2 million. Uh, the rental housing revolving fund has $362.7 million in, in the current balance and average cash out of $61.7 million. So it's six times uh, or, or six years worth of expenses is now in the fund. There, there is a Department of Transportation account related with the Kapalama Military Reservation improvements. Uh, it now has $109.9 million in it, an average cash out of zero. And I'm not making these numbers up. They come up, they, they come up of a, uh, the legislative auditor's reports that, that have just come out. So, um, and, and as a matter of fact, uh, we have a, um, uh, a, a, an auditor's report that has just come out, and you know they they listed uh, funds with monies available for transfer. Check with the AG about whether they can be transferred, and eliminated the ones that said, "Oh, the you know where the AG said no, you can't do." Potential funds available for transfer: four hundred eighty-three point six million. That's half a billion dollars. Okay, what's it doing? What is that money doing? Why is it sitting around? Why isn't it going to help people? Has anybody thought of that? Well, the auditor has. Yeah. There are other funds too, by the way. I'm, I'm thinking of the, uh, the that special energy fund, which has $150 million in it, uh, which is probably not going anywhere right now. And it's sitting as a little pocket of money. 
so I, I don't know if the auditor has has it all. There may be sort of um, marginal um, funds like that that could be used. Um, so okay, so they're not being used, um, and um, I guess um, and you have a big reduction in in tax receipts, and you have the the likelihood that that that's not going to go dramatically back to where it was. Um, and you have this, this uh, I guess it's a union move and the legislature is following along with a move to preserve salaries and preserve positions in the, in the state workforce. All of that sounds like a recipe for disaster. So what's the ghost of Christmas future here, Tom? Where are we going on this? It's not hard, not hard to see what's going to happen over the next couple of three years uh, with regard to the, you know, the fiscal variables uh, that the state faces. What happens when we just run out? Well, um, to an extent, it's already started happening. Uh, before, even before the pandemic struck, uh, we were having a negative out-migration of people. People were voting with their feet. They were heading for the hills. Um, so, and they, and they were heading for the hills because they just couldn't make ends meet here in the economy that we have. Uh, you know, dealing with the cost of living issues primarily, um, high costs, low pay, uh, those are, you know, that, that's a recipe that adds up to, heck, I can't make it here, I gotta get the, get the heck out. All right, then you lose, then you lose your workforce. <clears throat> and your tax base. Sorry, both, yes. So, um, you know, a number of, uh, over the past few weeks, we've covered this in from various angles, and a number of people have said, well, we, we got to get out of the, you know, the, the mono economy around the hotels, because it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of revenue controlled by relatively few companies, and those companies are in large part offshore, um, the profits from, you know, the big hotel organizations are spirited offshore and, and the jobs are, uh, they're not, they're not management jobs in the hotels. They're less than management jobs. Um, and so it's not a good economy uh, in troubled times. It's not a good economy in good times either, frankly. And, and so what we have to do in the new Hawaii, the the transformed Hawaii, the new normal that we have to build, affirmatively build, has to be some other industry. It doesn't have to be a mono economy industry, but something in the array of industries to take us off relying on tourism. And everybody, you know, they say, well, let's, let's go back to technology. I say go back because, you know, the idea of having a tech community here uh, goes back to John Burns and George Ariyoshi and all the way through. Um, would that solve the problem? Is that something that we collectively should consider? And if so, you know, how well would it do? Well, I think it's something we should have been considering all along. Uh, and I think we have been considering it all along, but we, we just dragged our feet so much uh, that, that it hasn't really happened. We, we have to uh, diversify our economy. Uh, um, but it hasn't happened. It so hasn't. What, will the, what, what can the legislature do? I mean, we do rely on them to solve this problem. And, and I see it as their problem. And well, the governor, of course, he should be, you know, providing leadership to them and us. Um, but what, what can the government do to solve this otherwise um, insoluble problem? Well, for I think for one thing, you got to cut government costs. I mean, we we um, uh, focusing on uh, you know there are, there are no losers in government, but you know the private sector can de get decimated is I think you know very wrong headed. It's it's totally unfair, and, and it's not the way our government should be run. Uh, we should. Um, you know, we should be sharing the pain. Uh, there's a lot of pain out there. Um, and seeing, seeing people 
uh, who get off scot free or more than scot free, like the you know the folks who are paid, the hundreds of people who are paid, uh, you know, without having to do any work. Um, it, it just makes my blood boil. So what what would you do if you had control of this? If you were the leg the legislature, the governor, what would you do in order to alleviate this one problem, this one disparity, this one inequity? What would you do? Would you knock off state employees? Would you reduce their salaries uh, or both? Probably a combination of both. Um, you, you really got to dig into the programs and services that the government's offering, and you got to classify them as must have, like to have, maybe should have, or, you know, aren't needed anymore. And, 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 and you know, get out the scalpel. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, everybody talks about we have to reinvent ourselves <clears throat> post-COVID or else. Um, and I don't think, you know, apropos to this discussion, I, I don't think that the burden of reinventing themselves should fall only on the private sector. It has to fall on everything and everybody in the state. And the legislature has to make sure that that happens. Um, everything it touches should be reinvented or at least considered for reinvention. Everything the governor touches, the same thing. Uh, and I don't know if there's time in the, in, the, in the week or two they'll have after they return from their second recess. Um, but this is something that I think we agree they should, they should consider, not, not because it's emergent right now today, but because it will be emergent on a long-term basis in terms of losing the, what do you want to call it, the economic viability of the state. Do you agree with me? Oh, yes. Um, we, we, have a, we have a war going on. And, and the war isn't being fought with, uh, you know, missiles and, and guns. And it's being fought with, uh, you know, monetary units. Um, you, you, you make it harder for uh, a society to exist. Um, you know, you, you're not going to have people cooperating with the, uh, you know, support of, of, of our government. If they're not here. Yeah. And the cavalry is not coming to our rescue. Things are so dicey in Washington, you can hardly expect regular understanding and contribution to the problem, uh, the problems in this state and in other states. Yeah, so I mean, when I, was, to... when I was growing up, uh, it was very important in Washington for, for there to be collegiality to, you know, work with people across the aisle. Now, you know, these days, it's a war zone. Uh, the people across the aisle are the enemy. And I think they actually uh, phrase it in those terms. Really. Wow. How life has changed. That's, that's sad. Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, let's, let's do this again and take a snapshot in a couple of weeks. I think uh, there'll be lots of things happening that we can talk about uh, in that period. Tom Yamachika, president of the Hawaii Tax Foundation. So appreciate you coming down. Aloha, Jay. Thanks so much. Aloha.